first of all, I'd, I'd like to to acknowledge um, George Bazanis of the New South Wales um, Castoreason Association. I can see there Dimitri Zajimus there. Welcome, Dimitri. And also, um, <coughs> welcome to Basil. I know you're very busy, mate, and I know you've got a meeting about quarter to eight um, this evening, so we really appreciate your time um, that you're giving us uh, for tonight. Now, I met you when I was in my early 20s, we, I, I met you, I think the first time I met you was in Perth on a new gas yeah. function. Yeah. Uh, we spent a few days together with uh, Gary Mitchell and Ian Salakis, who I met with you. And I, I never forget sitting at the back of the bus and seeing this tall, lanky guy walking three, walking down the aisle and sitting three, three seats in front of me and talking and being very boisterous and everyone acknowledging his presence. And I rem remember that... Uh, your good singing voice, Baz, um, <laughs> singing the grand old flag, the old yes. um, Melbourne theme song. I think that yeah. would have been with uh, your football club previously. And that's and Correct. we to sing that a few times. But uh, you stood out in the crowd and I always knew that you'd succeed in life. And your, and, and what you've done is, is just totally amazing. You've, you've, you've played football for West Perth. You've, you've played 24 games, I think, for West Perth. You've, you, you, in 1994, you, had, you won the best story. I think you were starting out with uh, your journalism mm. and you also won best uh, television uh, personalities, which was a great effort. You also had your own uh, footy show, I believe, called Basil's mm. Footy Show. Yeah. And um, you worked for uh, SEN in Melbourne, also 6PR in Perth well, for many years, which is equivalent to... 3AW, you also yeah. commentated the Australian Open and in 2012 you became a major commentator for our great game, the Australian Football League, for the AFL. You also had a portrait painted by an artist <laughs> for the Archibald Prize and yes. you became one of the 50 most eligible bachelors <laughs> for Clio, Clio magazine, which I thought was amazing, but you've mm. been claim to fame is that uh, you became our 2018 Cassie of the Year. Of the year. Um, also, Baz, one thing that's close to your heart is that you were very fortunate to, um, in 2000, in Sydney, to host the um, Olympic Games. And also, four years later, you went to Athens and also hosted the Olympic Games mm -hmm. there in 2004, which was, as you, you said once before, um, an absolute honour. And... Um, and now you've become the 46th, I think 46th, is that correct? Mm. Um, Mayor of Perth. So, mate, basically, how, how did you do it? How did you do it? <laughs> uh, well, Nick, thank, firstly, can I say thank you? You can all hear me okay? Yeah. Just checking, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the warm introduction and warm welcome. I, I must admit, when I hear it all back like that, I sort of think to myself, is that me? Have I done all of those things? But, um, look... You're probably right, that little bloke that got on the bus, or not little bloke, but that young bloke that got on the bus. I always, I always, um, I don't know, I always uh, sort of felt like I, I did stand out and I was never discouraged, I suppose, from mum and dad for being the person that I could be. And, and I, when I look back on my childhood and um, strong Castle Region parents, obviously, mum and dad instilled... Uh, I'd like to think the great qualities that have been instilled in all of us, uh, love and respect for our families, a sense of pride, uh, always doing the right thing, using common sense, working hard. I think values that we've all grown up with. But, but importantly, when I think back, and I, and I do sometimes think, how did I do all these things? Or why, why have I done them? More to the point. I sometimes think um, maybe the most important thing that mum and dad taught me and probably my mum was a real driver of this was self-confidence and self-belief, not to a point of putting other people down, but mum always, always reminded me, you know, believe in yourself. She often said to me, you are no better than anyone else, but no one else is any better than you. And uh, it's funny, um, now that I'm married uh, to my beautiful wife, Amy, she is uh, not of a Greek background, um, uh, but she's come to love and appreciate the Castellaresian uh, qualities. She says, in a, in a lovely, respectful way, she often says to me, gee, the Cassies have all got a superiority complex, haven't they? And I say, yeah, of course we have. That's because we're better than everyone else. So I, I, think, I think there's a bit of that in all of us. And, um, look, I, 
I, I've always just tried to make the most of whatever I'm doing. My uncle Con, who was chief magistrate here in Perth, he, uh, he never had children and I was very close to him. And he used to say to me, don't have big goals, just do your best every day. Go your hardest every day and you never know where that will take you. And, and really, that's pretty much what I've done. I've just tried to do my best every day at whatever it was that I was doing. But I, I guess I always, I always had one eye on well, what else could I do and how could I do it and, and what might be the next logical step to doing that. And I, I think some of that, Nick, a lot of that is just innate in, in us. It's a Castellaresian quality that we've got for whatever reason. We're blessed to have it. We're lucky to have it. And I think, you know, if I sum it up, it's really about making the most of the opportunities that come our way. And uh, I feel very fortunate to have had the upbringing that I've had and, and the background that I've had. I've been blessed. Um, your, your father, Anthony, and mum, Jessie, I, I believe I heard a story that your, your mother, when she was, she was the youngest sibling, of, mm. is that right, Baz? Yes. And when she was in Gustalorosa, when her family came over yeah. to Australia, she ended up staying there by herself. Is that correct? It is, and, and so when I look at those things that mum passed on to me, there's no doubt that mum had that in her because of what happened to her, say what happened, because of her life experience when she was young. So uh, this is a story worth telling because I think it reminds us all of how life was in Gusto Lorizor back in the late 20s, early 30s. It's something that would never happen now, but at the same time back then it was not unkind. Um, and it, it shows the loyalty and respect that our parents had for their parents and, and for their, their parents' parents. But mum was born in 1928 in Castellorizo. She was the youngest of five children, um, but mum was a twin. Gary Mitchell, who you mentioned already, my first cousin, uh, his mum, Anne, and my mum, Jessie, twin sisters. Many people know the Simeon twins, and they've met my mum or Auntie Anne in Castellorizo on their visits back. And, and in around about 1938, uh, 31 or two, um, my mum's parents decided it was time, like many of the Castellarian families, to go to Australia. It was time to make the trip. But mum's grandparents said to mum's parents, well, if you all go and leave us, we're going to be here on our own. We won't have any of the family with us. Why, won't, why don't you leave the youngest, Jessie? Uh, she wasn't Jessie at the time. She was Beba, I think. They used to call her that because a baby. Glickeria. Uh, was mum's name, but Beber, I think they called her. Why don't you leave the youngest with us? Now, that would be unheard of now, you know, a family moving to the other side of the world and leaving one of their children behind. But, you know, I don't think of that as a cruel act or as, um, as something that, that was deliberately unkind because I understand the family values that we all grew up with and I can understand why my grandparents would have respected their parents so much that they would have done that, even though we would never do that today. So mum was separated from her family at a young age and mum was a twin, so you can imagine that. And mum, to this day, still tells the story of when a boat would pull in to Gusto Lorizo, when a boat would pull in, mum would race down to the harbour and go and see if her family were on that boat coming back to her. So you can imagine the psychological impact that would have had on a young, on a young girl whose family had gone away from her. And not to say that her grandparents weren't very loving, but that, was, that would have been a tough thing to have happen. Fortunately or unfortunately, two years later, my, gra my mum's grandfather started to get a bit ill and, and, and mum's grandmother said, look, grand grandfather's getting sick. If something happens to him or something happens to us, Jessie will be on her own here or Beba will be on her own. So we think it's time that you go now and join the rest of your family. But that was two or three years later. And so by the, and mum made the trip as a young girl on her own, although she had family and friends that were also travelling to Perth at the time. But, you know, a three-month voyage with a little suitcase. I've got a beautiful photo of mum with a suitcase preparing to make that trip, saying goodbye to her grandparents and waiting to make the trip to see her parents. Finally, she arrives in Australia and she's reunited with her family, two and a half years behind them or maybe even three years behind them, and then goes to school with her twin sister, Anne. But, of course, Anne has been in Australia for three years now, speaks perfect English, has been to school for a few years, and mum sits in the corner and can't speak English because the only language she knows is Greek. Now, of course, like any kid at a young age, she adjusted fast. She got on and reacquainted with her twin sister and they're inseparable to this day very quickly. But I do think back to the profound impact that that journey would have had on my mum and I can see every day why my mum is the person that she is because of what happened to her or that experience as a younger person. So, 
you know, quite a traumatic thing to happen as, at a young age. Mum dealt with it. Mum made the most of it. Mum was always very optimistic. I'm very optimistic with everything I do because of that, I'm sure. And um, part of that journey that mum was on, I think, lives with me every day. And I often think, you know, I always see the good in everything. Um, I'm always optimistic. I'm a glass half full, not a glass half empty person. And, you know, I, I admire the courage that my mum showed to overcome that and become the person that she she became and met dad, married, had three children. And then, of course, many people know the story went full circle. My sister Roz moved back to Greece uh, in 1980 to get married to a, a Greek boy from Greece, Manoli Shero Nikolas. They've got a wonderful life and a wonderful family. But can you imagine my mum in 1980 with no phones and emails and faxes, knowing her own journey, having to say goodbye to her own daughter? <laughs> And waving her off, sending her all the way back to where she came from all those years later. So it's been an extraordinary family story in that sense. You've got a, your beautiful wife, Amy. You've got three beautiful children, uh, Chloe, uh, uh, Chloe, Anthony and Ava. Ava, that's right. Um, mate, they go home, they see their dad on the TV, he's become Lord Mayor. How do they handle it? How, what? Yeah. Seeing their, their father, I suppose they don't know anything better, do they, Baz? They've just seen you. No, no, no. And, and Nick, probably in the way that that's right. They handle it because dad is dad and, and that's what dad does. Uh, they've grown up seeing dad on TV, calling the footy or hosting Weekend Sunrise or uh, Telethon over here, which is a big event, or going away to the Olympics or the Australian Open. And, and so it's just normal to them. And the kids are so grounding. You know, my wife is grounding. My mum was always very grounding always made a point of saying feet on the ground, dad as well. And my wife has taken on mum's mantle in many ways and, you know, reminds me that at home you're a dad and a husband and, and that is as it should be. And the same with the kids. So I think it's a great leveller being a family man. I think I'm a better person since I became a dad, a, a, a husband and then a dad. There's no doubt about that. And many people will, will know that story is familiar to them in whatever they do. But... Um, so it is a good leveller and a good reminder of what we do is important in our work and in our other lives. But the most important job we do is be a father and a, and a husband. And um, so I'm very fortunate that Amy gives me the, the space and support and comfort to go and pursue all of those things whilst running the family home so well. And, and my kids enjoy it. They love it. But dad's dad and they don't mind telling me when I've done the wrong thing or People aren't as uh, enamoured with me as uh, maybe I am with myself. So it, it's a good way to be. But it's a lovely thing to be able to share with the kids. And, you know, when I, I became Lord Mayor, it's only a month ago, and to have mum and dad, 91 and 92, my uncle Con uh, in his late 80s, my sister and brother-in-law, Diane and Kevin, my own family, my in-laws and my wife Amy and my three children present, it's special. Very special, and I, I felt very privileged to be able to share it with them. And, and I've said to everybody who sent me a message, uh, whether they're in Perth or anywhere else, uh, it was a tough win. I ran against six other candidates to become Lord Mayor. So I had to win an election, and I had to beat six other candidates. I was one of seven. And, and I say to all of them, it was a victory for all of us. It was a victory for every Greek Australian, and particularly an ev a victory for every Castellarian Australian, because we've shared similar journeys. And... Um, any time a, a Greek Aussie or a Kazi Aussie rises to any position of prominence, and I've always thought this in my TV career, I'm not just doing it for me, I'm doing it for my family, I'm doing it for all of us, as it should be. And I, I take great pride in that. I think that's very important. I mean, you've been a great role model to a lot of people and a mentor to a lot of people. Apart from your parents, who, who gave you that incentive to to get on with life, who was your, basically, who was your role model? In yeah, yeah. Uh, look, so mum and dad, obviously, are yeah. very prominent in my life. My uncle Con, who I mentioned, I'm very close to him, a great mentor, a great philosopher, my uncle Con, for anyone who's met him. He's a, a unique, one of a kind. He's like, uh, he's a cross between a great comedian and a great philosopher and a great legal intellect as well. And uh, he was very motivational in his own way and we always clicked and uh, he motivated me a lot. He brought the best out of me and still does. And I've been very lucky with two older sisters, not only to have their love and support, but also two very wise and brilliant brother-in-laws, Manoli and Kevin. Um, in many ways, I was like a, a little 
son tagging along. I'm sure I got in the way and I think back to how annoying I must have been when they were in their young married lives. But I, I was very lucky because of I was almost an only child and because my sisters were 13 and 15 years older than me and they both married quite young, Diane at 19 and Rosalind at 21. So I grew up almost as an only child and I spent a lot of my time because my parents were older. I spent a lot of time amongst adult company and particularly my own family and my brother-in-law's and they were hard workers and achievers and guys that had great qualities and got on and did stuff themselves. And so often it didn't really have to be said. I just observed from them, like many of us have done with our own families, you know, nobody said, go and be a great builder. Nobody said, be a doctor or be a lawyer. Often nobody said, go and be a pharmacist or any of the great things that the Cassie Greeks have done. Um, we just saw it and we thought, right, that's the way to do it. That's what's expected or that's what I'm capable of. Go out and do it. Our, our families have done it. That's what I should do. And and so in many ways, it was like that with my extended families, my uncles and aunties as well. They're all great role models. My cousins were all older than me and I looked up to them and admired them. And I've been very fortunate, both sides of my family, the, the Zempler side, um, which extends to the Michaels and um, the Boyancis side of the family, my grandmother's side, and also the Simeons, my my mum's maiden name. Um We've all been very close. We've all had lots of family get-togethers over the years. And to see the elder statesmen of the families holding court at family picnics, entertaining the crowd, making announcements, I loved it. And I thought, oh, it's brilliant. That's what I want to do. I want to be the bloke in the middle holding court. So that was the bloke you saw get on the bus, I reckon. At about 18 or 19, he was starting to emerge. And uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that he did, but I blame my family for it. I'm, I'm going to say to you, you've achieved a lot. I mean, we know next year you're going to be 50 years old. Yes. And we're, we're hoping that you're going to have a birthday party on uh, the island of Augusta Loisel and that we're all going to get a Guernsey. But yeah. how can one person fulfil so much in 50 years? What are you going to do in the next 50 years? That's, that's the that's that, 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 question. Look, I think my wife would probably like me to say, and my kids would like me to say, take the foot off the gas a bit. And, and that is something that, you know, you have to get better at doing, don't you? Um, you, do, you do have to do that. Um, and that's the challenge for me. But right now I'm, I'm head, head, headlong into um, being uh, the Lord Mayor of the City of Perth. I'm still on the radio and I'm still working TV and I'm very flexible. I'm, I'm very fortunate my employers are flexible. And even though the Lord Mayor's position is full-time, it's full-time flexible, if that makes sense. So I can work the hours as I need to. And fortunately, I can do that uh, to a certain degree with seven as well. And I, I'm very thankful to my employers for providing me that flexibility. Um, so it's the same, really, Nick. Uh, no big goals. I mean, there are things that I'd like to achieve as Lord Mayor, but with my own career and own life, I just want to be the best husband I can be, best father I can be, best son I can be, best uh, brother I can be. And, um, and I, I've always found, you know, things take care of themselves if you just go your hardest and do your best. And, and that's, you know, with a lot of young people that try and get into journalism or broadcasting, they say, Basil, what's the secret? And, and really, we're lucky in my career. There is no secret. The secret is hard work. Just keep turning up. And uh, I say that a lot. Sometimes it's just being there, being there and being enthusiastic and ready to go and ready to do your best. And, and even though that sounds obvious, and maybe to us it sounds obvious, um, I, think, I think that is uh, an advantage that we sometimes have because not everybody does turn up prepared and ready to go. Right. So if you do it often enough, I think you often find that things fall your way. And there's an old saying from a, an old golfer, it might have been Tom Watson, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And I feel that that's been uh, a strong uh, a st strong theme during my career. That's, that's co correct. You make your own luck. But you're a people's person. You're mm. loved by many people. Thank you. Uh, and you're a bit of a comedian. <laughs> uh, is it uh, Kim, Kim Beasley, the governor? When he, He's the governor, yes. He, when you initiated, you, uh, uh, you told him that you, yours was bigger than his. Now, before, before the ladies get excited, can you explain what happened there? Our, our chains. I, I, I did say that to him. Uh, on reflection, maybe that wasn't the right thing to say to the governor, but he took it in the right spirit and so did everybody else. I said it in a small crowd, I should add. Um, uh, yeah, look, you know, we've got a personality. We are who we are. Uh, I have to remember where I am when I'm talking, of course. 
But, you know, I've been reminded uh, in the last few weeks in particular that, you know, we get to where we get to because we are who we are. And, of course, you've got to be respectful of your surrounds and your environment and you've got to temper things that you might otherwise say in different company. But, you know, I'm also very mindful of you can't, I, I, I don't want to change who I am uh, just because of new roles that I have. I mean, you are who you are and that's how I got elected and why I got to where I am throughout my career and throughout this sort of uh, Lord Merrill journey that's very new and in its infancy. So, and, and often we hear people criticise politicians and I hate saying I'm a politician because I don't feel like the Lord Mayor is a politician, but I, of course, it's naive to say that. There is a, a, an element of political uh, uh, force at work with a role like this. But, you know, uh, we often hear people, journos, often criticise politicians for being cardboard cutouts, robots, saying the same thing. And we sometimes say to footballers when we're talking about them, you know, they, they read from the script, they don't break convention. Um, so, we, you know, then when if you yourself go to one of those roles, I think I've got an obligation and a duty not to become a cardboard cutout, not to read from the script every time, but to keep my personality, to inject it, all of those sorts of things. So I'm mindful of that. I've got to find the happy balance and the happy medium and I'm learning and you always learn, don't you? But, um, you know, I think people except that uh, if your heart's in the right place, you uh, are a person of character, you acknowledge your mistakes and uh, you try your hardest all the time. I think Australians are very forgiving and very understanding because that's how, that's how they themselves are. That's how we all are. And uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with making a mistake from time to time and saying sorry because that's what happens in the real world. That's right. And, you know, you must pinch yourself getting up in the morning and thinking, I'm, I'm the Lord Mayor. I mean, yeah. to get to that position, I know you what you what you want to achieve as Lord Mayor. You want to clean up the streets, make uh, Perth more attractive mm -hmm. to tourists. What else did you want to do to uh, oh, with crime? Also, you, I think you yeah. mentioned about crime in Perth. It's r running a bit rampant, is it over mm. there? Yeah, look, it's a basic approach to start with. To be perfectly honest, and I campaigned on making it a cleaner, safer, and friendlier city. Perth's a beautiful place. We've got the best weather. In Australia, wherever you are listening to this, I'm sorry, but our weather is better than yours. Uh, that's a guarantee. Um, but it's not as safe as it used to be. Uh, people aren't as welcome or don't feel as welcome in their city as they used to when we were kids. A and we've got to fix that. We've got to address that. Um, and we need to make it a safer city, friendlier city, a more attractive environment. And then it's about putting on compelling people-focused events and attractions to attract people back. We've got a small residential population in the city. It's only about 28,000. It needs to be at about 90,000 by the year 2050. That's not that far away. So how do we do that? Well, we work with the government to make sure we do great things. We've got a university coming to the city, which is terrific. Uh, we've got to get on with the government to make sure that we can do things together. But we've got to create the right environment. Uh, but I'm, I've been tremendously encouraged. Perth people want what's best for our capital city. They want to be proud of our capital city and they want other people around Australia to be proud of coming to Perth and coming to visit. And it is a beautiful place. So uh, we've got a, a good environment now, a good opportunity. We didn't have a council and a Lord Mayor for three years. We've got elected officials again now. Uh, we're keen to get on and do stuff and we're getting on and doing stuff. So I sound like a politician now, I know. But it's a, at the start of your journey, not that it's a honeymoon period, but it's the start of the journey. It is an exciting it's an exciting thing to be a part of because you feel that people want to come along with you. So I, I, I feel blessed. In answer to your question, you wake up in the morning, I feel blessed to be able to do it and do it all. I mean, parents are, are, are usually uh, they're, they're so happy that their children succeed. You, you've just gone that, that further <laughs> mile, mate. Um, also, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, when you were, what obstacles did you go through to be, to be, to get elected? What, were there any stumbling blocks? Or did, um, what, what, look, we, we ran a pretty good campaign, to be honest. And if I look back on the campaign, I, look, I think where I was, I, I, I backed my instinct. Um, I had a couple of people around me who had been there and done it, and that was important. Uh, I think one of the best things I did was get quality uh, assistance in. And my cousin, Gary Mitchell, I mean, people that know Gary, I mean, Gary uh, was not a paid member of my team. He was a family member of my team and uh, Gary is as responsible for me uh, being elected as anyone. He worked his backside off for me. 
And he actually was a nominee for candidate for council as well. But he sacrificed his own campaign for me. And that's the that's the sort of family I grew up in, if you like. And uh, so you, you surround yourself with good people. We got it pretty right, actually. And I'm proud of the fact that we backed our instincts and went with it. It was a pretty simple platform, um, a plan for homelessness uh, and uh, tougher on law and order, uh, making sure that uh, antisocial behaviour becomes a thing of the past in the city. And I just campaigned on me being a strong communicator and a good leader and somebody that wanted to get in in to do the right thing and get things done for Perth. So uh, I, the campaign went well. Um, we won. Obviously. We had a nervous we had a nervous election night because the count started badly, but we caught up and then hit the front and stayed in front and uh, pretty exhilarating. But, you know, the next day you're in there working, so it doesn't last long. The honeymoon is over fast. But... Um, I only think I ever would have done it once, win or lose. I won, so I'm glad I did because uh, I, I used to say to people, I'm not, I, I would have been happy to run and learn all the great things I did and meet all the great people I did and I would have been better and richer for the experience, but I wanted to win as well and we did win and I'm very proud of that. And we're proud of you, mate, too. Um, but also, what, what, what are the Perth uh, residents thinking of Melbourne, what we've been through the last few months Baz, yeah. with the COVID restrictions that we've we've gone through i mean mm. i think we're in our 13th or 14th yeah up day they call them here no deaths no no covid uh, yes. cases have you guys got any cases over there at the moment and when no, you we're, they'll, they'll we're, the we're, in, for us? we're in good shape and uh i can you know we we certainly the west australians and the victorians they they love to spar and have fun over the footy in particular we make fun of your weather and you make fun of how far away we are and all of those things. Um, but I, I've got to say very genuinely, we feel blessed in WA, in Perth, to have been able to pretty much carry on with life as per usual um, to a large degree. The Premier's done an excellent job in keeping us safe and uh, he, he locked the borders down. It was controversial in its own way, but it allowed us to lead pretty much normal lives. And, and I know from broadcasting on the radio and um, and on the TV, but just in everyday life, when we looked across to Victoria and, and New South Wales when they were in lockdown, South Australia for that matter, and Queensland as well, but you had the worst of it and uh, our hearts were with you because we know how tough that was. We only had two or three weeks of it, maybe a little longer. And you've had long, long periods of it and uh, that is not an easy thing to do. So... Um, I think it's the one time when we genuinely felt compassion for our fellow Australians and our fellow, you know, our Victorians. And there was that line, we are all Victorians, and it was true. We were brothers and sisters through all of this. Oh, that's good. Um, I'm conscious of the time, Baz. I know you've got a meeting at court to wait. So I've got, a, I've got a, about five minutes, Nick, if that's all right. Um, uh, is there any questions, Caroline? Do you want to just uh, see if anyone would like to uh, ask Baz any questions before we finish up? Nick. Zervos, obviously, in the, uh, the chat. But, Lena, did you want to say something? Yes, there is actually a question that's come in from Mark Zervos. Mark, would you like to ask your question? Uh, I'll just unmute Mike. Unmute everybody. All right. Uh, Basil, it's Mike Zervos. Um, and first of all, your memories and, uh, reminded me of your uncle Consempolis when he was living at um, Head Street Elwood with Peter Castella. Yes. And, uh, he was the first uh, philosopher, in, uh, intellectual professional. <laughs> so he, he shaped me enormously as a young man. I've never met yeah, him. Yeah, me too. And my, my own daughter, Cassie, has followed in your footsteps into the world of journalism uh, and is, uh, has, has the Cassie fierce determination. But my question is more of you as a dad, as we are more entrenched in Australia as our children are born here and most, a lot of us, if not all of us, are born here ourselves. Yeah. Um, how do you, what's your thinking about carry on that greatness in mm. terms of our language, our heritage, our religion, yeah. our customs? So uh, as, a, as a fellow dad, I'd just welcome your, yeah. thoughts, your thoughts there. Yeah, look, Michael, it's a debate that I often have with myself and, I, and certainly I've had with mum over the years. And congratulations for Cassie, by the way. And, Cassie MC, the function at the Cassie House in Victoria in 2018, and that was wonderful. Two cousins working for Channel 7, Cassie just starting out and me towards the other end, and uh, that was a lovely night. And uh, I, I, I keep a watch on her career. My old boss here at 7 in Perth is, is now her boss 
in um, Melbourne at seven in Melbourne. And congratulations, she's doing brilliantly. Look, I, I say to everybody, um, the the second best thing that's happened to me in my life and career is to be born uh, of Greek heritage. But I, and I and I hope it doesn't upset anybody for me to say this, but I think we have to be mindful of this. But the the best thing that happened to us is that our ancestors chose Australia to be their home. So we should be fiercely proud of our Hellenism, uh, our Greek roots, our Greek heritage. Keep it alive wherever we can. Go to the Greek church. uh, Learn the language. Maintain the customs. But we have to remember um, we're Australians. We we go to school here. We went to school here. Uh, This has given us all the wonderful opportunities that we have, this country. Uh, We pay our taxes here. We've built our lives here. And... um, we are Australians first. We're Greek Australians and we're fiercely proud of that, fiercely. And we should never forget that. But this is the country that has given us our opportunities. And uh, I, I, I think we should always be very conscious of that. And I understand those of uh, the older generations, perhaps they sometimes slightly see it round the other way and I respect and admire that in them. But for me... Um, we, we should always remember that this country, it, our background has given us the skills to be able to make the most of it, but it's this country that's given us the opportunities that we all have and, and we should never forget we are Australians. Beautifully yeah. said, thank you. Peter, Peter Olgus, one more you or you to go? Yeah, sure, one more for sure. One more, one more. Peter Olgus, you've got a question? Yeah, hi, Basil. Good to see you. Um, Peter Olgus from the Greek Herald. Okay. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned there's like 100 different projects going on with media and obviously being as mayor. What's the one thing that I guess keeps you grounded as well as you can? Yeah. Um, well, well, they, I must say, you know, now as Lord Mayor, um, it appears to be, uh, and, and it is, it's a, it's a wonderful honour, but you're dealing with everyday people and you're dealing with everyday people's everyday concerns. So in its own way, and whilst there's fabulous parts to the role, there's also very grounding parts to the role. And, you know, you're representing ratepayers and residents. And sometimes you're talking about their back fences or their footpaths or the lights out the front of their street or their house. So that in itself is grounding. Um, but, you know, the most important role that I've got, which happens to be the most grounding role that I've got, and is your best reality check every single day, is the role of uh, husband and father. And uh, that's why I feel very blessed to have... Um, such a loving family environment where um, we speak honestly and openly because that's a reminder that, um, you know, it doesn't matter what, what Olympic Games you're flying away to or weekend sunrise every weekend as it was or the Olympics or the tennis or uh, any of those things. Um, it's what you do at home that really defines you and uh, the qualities that are most important are those qualities. So uh, I think it's my role as a dad and as a husband that, that is the, that's the definitive role, I think, and, and, and it is for all of us. Great to hear. Thanks, Basil. Oh, Basil, I know you're conscious. Of, you've got to go now, mate, but uh, I just want to thank you You've been a, uh, for your time. You've been a great influence to all of us, and more importantly, you, you're such a down-to-earth person, and, and we, we love you, and we, uh, we hope you achieve everything you want to fulfil with being mayor. And I'm absolutely honoured that uh, I met you when I was young and, and we still hold a great friendship. Sometimes I, I tell people I'm like my, one of my mates is a mayor of Perth and they, they, they can't believe it. And then they go, Basil Zemplis, you, Basil Zemplis. So, mate, congratulations. I, I don't know what, what else you, you can achieve in life. But, um, you know, as I said, we, we all love you and we're all, all, all cheering for you for the next few years. And Thank you. Come over to Perth and, and visit you. Thank you. Well, can I just say that uh, I've always felt that support. Uh, I've always been very proud of my Greek heritage and I've always tried, wherever it was, whatever forum, radio, TV, Lord Mayor, to, to never forget that and always represent my Greek Australian heritage. And uh, to all of the Cassies everywhere who have supported me and encouraged me and been proud of my achievements, I want you to know that I have felt that and I have been honoured to have it and it means so much. And, uh, you know, I feel that in everything I do, I represent each and every one of you, your families, your kids, 
and your ancestors and all of our ancestors. And uh, it's it's a responsibility that I enjoy and I'm fiercely proud of. So thanks for all the love and support and thanks for always uh, being so encouraging of everything I do. I really appreciate it. Bravo. Well done. Good on you guys. Thank you, everybody. We'll speak yeah. again soon. Bezel, 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 bezel. Yo. Yo, can I just take a quick photo? Everybody sure. smile for the screen yeah. so I can just take a quick photo for our website. So everybody smile. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Basil. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Well, that... Um, Lena, while we've got everyone on there, is George Pizana still there? George, you still there? Yes, he is. Can you unmute yourself, mate? Are you muted? I can't hear you. Everybody can unmute themselves now. So George, please feel free. Me. George? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, just um, with everyone still on, on the meeting here, uh, everyone, this is George Pizanis. He's, he's our president of the Castle Reason Association New South Wales. Um, George became president, what, four years ago, George? Five, five, and, a half, five and a half years ago where, when there was... There were a few issues and problems in, in Sydney and uh, the building was sold. And, and this man that we've got on screen now should be congratulated. He had the foresight of buying a building in Kingsford around the corner from an old Cassie club. It had a lot of people knocking him and, and saying, why did he go and do this? But uh, George has done a miraculous job over the last few years by getting the younger set back up, up to 100 members now and he's... Re we restored this building that they purchased and rented it out for two hundred thousand dollars a year. So he's he should be congratulated. I might get you to mention uh, you can say whatever you want, George, about, about the club, what it's going to be, and if you're going to have offices in there. In a couple of minutes, mate, of your time, I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you very much, everybody, for having me. Um, so we embarked uh, probably about four years ago to buy the building. Um, it came up for sale and. Um, I was at that stage, uh, oh, sorry, about five years ago now, well, I was at that stage just becoming uh, the, the president and uh, on I, when I called an emergency meeting um, and uh, I asked everybody what they want to do because we had some money in the bank and um, the decision was made overnight. We went and bought the building. Uh, we pondered on what we're going to do with it. We, we used it for a couple of functions. It was a very old building. So about two and a half years ago, we knocked it down and um, we started building and then all of a sudden APRA came in and we had these all, all problems with money being lent to, to businesses. So it, that all stopped. So I was on hold for about a year and a half and um, it was coming close to us just giving up. But I, I, pondled, I, I forced everybody and I really just dug my heels in and said, look, we're not going to let this go. Um, we've just got to keep moving forward. We've got to be positive. Um, we had a few, few people on the board leave. Uh, that was unfortunate. We brought a few others on. And, um, and we moved forward and we got ourselves a loan. It was a private loan as opposed to a bank loan. Um, and, we, and the builders stayed with us the whole way, which is pretty amazing because most of them would have left by now. Um, and uh, so we're at, at today's stage, we are at uh, a 90% complete building um, that is in excess of probably $8 million worth. And uh, um, so the, the front of the building is uh, what we call a levity, the new... Greek Bakery, you can look it up online, who that is. Uh, they've got a chain of stores in Sydney and this will be their flagship store. They've got a, a, a restaurant around about 160 square metres. Um, it'll seat probably 40 or 50 people inside it and then about 20 outside. Uh, brand new building. Uh, upstairs from there, there's a two-bedroom, two-storey apartment and a three-bedroom, two-storey apartment, which we own. We won't ever sell. They're not strated and they'll be rented out. So the combined income from the front of the building will bring us in around about one hundred and ninety to two hundred thousand dollars a year, which is fantastic. Um, now the back of the building, which is the most important part, um, apart from the obviously the, the income side of it, is the downstairs area will be a eighty square meter, um, what we call a cultural center or museum, and what that will hold will be all our artifacts from the old building, from the from the island uh, photos, and we'll run two large televisions. Uh, one of them will be drone footage of the island, which we have in 8K. Um, the other will be live stream to the island. And we'll also have a touchpad TV, which you can then look up who you are and where you came from by a family tree. Um, so all of that's happening now. We're, we're putting it all together. 
we're, we're talking about holographic projectors going into the museum too, so we have, so we have uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, the photo of Castellorizor and the water hitting up against the, the, uh, the concrete um, in, the, in the museum. Um, so it'll be more of a, a, a real uh, perspective of what the place looks like. So we're, we're getting into all that now. The upstairs area will be um, a function centre, which you can rent out. Uh, we're going to do a lot of functions there. We'll have Melbourne Cup there. We'll do our 40 nights there. We'll, we'll, we'll rent it out for, um, uh, you know, christenings, wakes, funeral, whatever it may be that comes along. Um, and that will house uh, 100 people seated. And outside will be an extra 30, which is an, a, a barbecue um, uh, al fresco area. Um, it'll have a small commercial kitchen, which will be able to service that area. But most of it will be done by catering. Um, and uh, it's a pretty exciting building. Um, if you want to get onto Facebook, you'll see the, the building um, uh, in, its, in its stages. And you can see it now where the scaffold has come down. Uh, it's pretty amazing, and um, uh, and we've got a, a board that's been pretty positive and been working really hard to get to where we are today. Um, and it's been a, a struggle. I've got to tell you, it's been a, a hell of a struggle. It's a strain on everyone. I, this is my seventh year doing this, and um, it's it's taken its toll. But you know what? The the we, we I could see the forest through the trees. I mean, it it really was an amazing um, uh, feat to where we got today. But uh, it's a dream that I've always had to do, and I never wanted to let this this thing go to waste. And now we've got it, and uh, we'll be opening on the sixth of February next year. And um, it'll be just a most amazing building, and it'll bring back what we always had, which is to be the beacon of, of the Greek uh, community in this in this state. Um, and uh, you know, bringing along with the other states now with the KCA, um, it basically involves all of us together um, to to. You know, help each other and to to look upon what everyone else is doing and bring everybody together. Uh, but more importantly, to look the foresight of who we're going to leave it to, because it's no good building an amazing building when you've got nobody to leave it to. Because if we end up leaving tomorrow, then we've got to have someone there. So we have a a, a younger committee who is ready to take over. It may be next year, it may be the year after, but they're ready, um, and they're and they're positive and they know what to do with the place. So I all I urge all of you if you can once this COVID business is over, um, if you can get up to Sydney, I'm happy to take you through the building. It's a pretty amazing place. Well done, George. Well done. Is there any questions? Anyone ask any questions? No. Can you hear me? George, it's Lena again. Um, yeah. How many members have you actually got? Paid members, and do you mind if I ask how much they actually pay for their membership? Well. Membership is $25 a year and there's a special five-year membership at $99, which we're urging people to do. Now, what the five-year does is it takes you to 2025 and that's the end of the life membership that we've had, which started in 2000. So the whole thing will regenerate from there on. So it'll, um, we'll start again in 2025, whether I'm there or not, probably not. But um, uh, now, as far as the amount of members we've got, we've got 350 life members which have come through from 2000. Um, and we've also got another <coughs> couple of hundred members and obviously the, the younger set that have, that have been with us. So um, uh, the more and more we're, uh, we're getting close to the, the, the building being open, the more and more people are joining because they want, they're, they're, they're curious to see what we're going to do with it. But you've got to be also mindful of what you can give them because you can't just pay $25 and get nothing for it. So we're looking at, um, obviously, there's a 10% discount if they want to go and have a coffee at a levity. Um, they'll show their card. They can walk into the building, um, into the, the cultural centre, um, which will be on the same level, and uh, they'll be able to have their cafe there instead of into the, into the, um, uh, the restaurant itself. Um, if they want to book the uh, uh, function centre upstairs, there'll be a discount for that too. So th there is benefits for becoming a member, but most importantly is, is to contribute to what we're doing and to know that you've contributed to the place. And, and that's important because without members, we're just an, an empty building. That's all we are. Um, so it, it is important. Hopefully one day we'll be able to have a joint function together, George. Yeah. It should be beautiful um anyway we don't know what, what position we're in at the moment down here but uh 
I know you guys are running rampant at Bondi and all that, and uh, we're stuck. Ah, yeah. We're stuck in a shell here. But anyway, look, thanks, thanks a lot. Look, we all appreciate what you've done up there. I mean, obviously, my my yeah, yeah, Maria James is a, a, a big fan of the Cassie Club, and I don't think she'd be too happy now or how, how it was. But uh, I think she'll no. be a bit of a smile on her face now to see that the uh, the club's going to be re- resurrected again. So well done, mate. Thank you very much. uh, Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody. See you, mate. Bye. Okay. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of our Cassie Connect for the third event. Again, I want to thank you all for your support. It's fantastic. And feel free to invite um, other people along for the next session. Um, The next one will be in March and you will get notified for that. We have a special guest, but we're just securing him at the moment. And so, look, now Kazi Connect is all about talking to each other. So unmute yourselves. Again, thank you again for joining us. Nick, thank you very much for um, everything tonight. And please feel free. Chat amongst yourselves. And, and Lena, before I go, Lena, I'd like to thank you for for what having the foresight to do this. Um, it's it's I reckon it's it's a it's a great connection for all of us, and um, hopefully we, we can keep it going even once the COVID finishes. We can keep it going. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate you saying that. Um, I think I've got a radio. Can you hear me? Yeah, I yeah. remember when I first came to the club, it was actually on a date with my husband. And uh, Diane, I don't know if you remember, but you asked me, who am I? Um, and um, I said, well, I'm actually with Peter and I think I've been at the club ever since. So um, I'm the Xenor because I'm Italian by background. But thank you for welcoming me. And uh, I do this on behalf of my mother-in-law. I don't know if many of you know her, but Sylvia Coates, it's in memory of her where she worked a lot for the club and and a lot of the other family members that I have, like Sylvia and Chico and um, Connie, my cousin, Connie Gregory as well, and Mari and Nick. Yeah, yeah. It's my pleasure to actually um, support the club and do anything that I can to actually enhance and grow it for Victoria. So it's my pleasure and thank you, Nick, for acknowledging me.